All right, thanks, Tyler. Uh, good evening, everyone. Could you turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, and you should have my translation in front of you. We're going to uh, read from my translation uh, to start off with, and uh, we're going to be... Uh, we're going to be continuing uh, this uh, study of uh, Paul's uh, encouraging Timothy to experience his sanctification and therefore uh, serve as a, a stark contrast to the conduct and behavior or the behavior of the false teachers, the unrepentant apostate pastors in, in the Roman province of Asia. So uh, what Paul says to Timothy, as I pointed out last evening in verses 20 and 21, actually reinforces the command that uh, Paul issued uh, that, that uh, he issued at the end of verse 19, that every Christian that uh, confesses the name of the Lord must abstain from uh, wickedness or unrighteousness. Now he's going to develop that further, reinforce that command uh, by his, uh, in verses 20 and 21. So uh, as we'll see, it, he, the, uh, this whole passage is talking about Timothy continuing to experience his sanctification, which is applicable to us because that's exactly what God wants us to do. So, and that's all contingent upon us obeying uh, the Word of God, Paul's apostolic teaching with the gospel, which is in our New Testament. So, uh, let's take a moment of silent prayers as, as, as our custom. We take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves, to uh, just determine if we need to confess any sins to the Father. This restores our fellowship with God and the filling of the Spirit, uh, which are maintained by our obedience to what the Spirit says to us through the teaching of the Word of God. That's when we're obeying the command of Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit. And Colossians 3.16, to let the word of Christ richly dwell in our soul. So uh, if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing, distracting to you, do what uh, 1 Peter 5.7 says, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because he cares for you. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you, Father, for your grace and your mercy and your love. We thank you for all that you've done for us through your son's death and resurrection and also the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We thank you, Father, for our position in Christ, our union and identification with him and his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection and session at your right hand. We thank you for now that you've delivered us out of the slave market of sin and Satan's kingdom and transferred us to the kingdom of your beloved son. We thank you for the fact that we are guaranteed a resurrection body by yourself and also rewards if we're faithful. Help us to be good stewards with our time, talent, and treasure so that we can receive a full reward and hear your son say, well done, good and faithful slave. Uh, we thank you, Father, for uh, Mark Christina's new baby, Oliver. We thank you for the fact that he is uh, a healthy uh, boy, and we just thank you, Father, for them and their, uh, for their um, uh, being a part of this ministry and the, and the new baby, and we pray, Father, that uh, they would raise him up in the ways of the Lord, and so we thank you, Father, for this new baby, along with uh, Nathan and with Bill and Crystal's child, and we just pray that both parents would uh, raise these children up in the ways of the word and uh, the Word of God. We thank you, Father, for uh, the Thompsons. We thank you for Titus and Jody and their hospitality and opening up their home four days a week and the sacrifices that they make. Uh, we just thank you, Father, for uh, not only for Titus and Jody, but also Tyler and Cheyenne and their faithfulness to this ministry and all that they contribute to this ministry as well uh, that you know all about. We just uh, pray, Father, that you would help everyone who is uh, 
in the audience, help them to understand what's being taught and to understand and make application of the things that they'd be learning. We pray that they would be transformed by the message, that they would receive uh, this uh, message this evening as the word of God, which it is. We pray that you would empower me to communicate this uh, verse this evening, 2 Timothy 2.20, with accuracy and clarity, reverence and respect and power, so your people are built up and edified. So help me communicate accurately your word, your message to your people, and not to leave anything out or add anything more to what you want me to say to your people. We pray that each person will be spoken to as individuals and as a corporate unit. So, Father, we pray for this message in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Uh, could you, uh, be, we're going to begin at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, and I'm going to read from my translation. I want to read all the way through verse uh, 21, and uh, our subject is verse 20 here this evening, where we're going to have uh, Paul re reinforcing his command at the, at the end of verse uh, 19, uh, here in verse 20, he's going to use a household metaphor to reinforce that command that he uh, issued at the end of verse 19. And I mentioned this in passing last evening. So in 2 Timothy 2.1, it says, uh, You therefore, reading from my translation, of course, You therefore, my spiritual child, Timothy, continue to make it your habit of permitting yourself to be empowered by means of that which is grace, namely union and identification with the Christ who is Jesus. Also the things which you heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these things I solemnly charge you to entrust to faithful men, those of such character who will have also made themselves competent to teach others. So I solemnly charge you to accept your share of suffering as an excellent soldier of the Christ who is Jesus. Certainly, absolutely no one who has chosen for himself to serve in the military does become involved in those activities which are a part of civilian life in order that he would please his commanding officer. Furthermore, in fact, if anyone does at any time compete as an athlete, if he does not compete as an athlete according to the rules, then he can never, as a rule of athletics, receive the victor's crown. The farmer, who is hardworking, must be the first to receive a share of the crops. Begin to carefully consider what I am communicating, and continue doing so. Indeed, the Lord will give you understanding with regards to each and every one of these things. Continue to make it your habit of remembering Jesus, who is the Christ, as risen from the dead ones, David's biological descendant in accordance with my gospel, because of which I am presently suffering hardship to the point of imprisonment as a criminal. But in fact, the word originating from God is never imprisoned. For this reason, I always endure each and every type of adversity on behalf of the chosen ones in order that they themselves will also enter into experiencing salvation, which is by means of faith in the Christ who is Jesus along with eternal glory. This statement is as an eternal spiritual truth trustworthy, namely, if and let us assume that it's true for the sake of argument, that each and every one of us has died with Christ, and we all agree that this is true then each and every one of us, as a certainty, will also in the future live with him. If, and let us assume that it's true for the sake of argument, that any of us endures, then we will indeed certainly reign with him. If, and let us assume that it's true for the sake of argument, any of us refuses to follow him, then he also will in fact certainly refuse us. If, and let us assume that it's true for the sake of argument, that any of us is unfaithful, he continues to remain faithful because he is, as an eternal spiritual truth, never able to be untrue to himself. Continue to make it your habit of bringing into remembrance these things, the things in verses 11 through 13. I solemnly charge in the presence of the Lord not to at any time argue about words for absolutely no useful purpose, because those who hear are destroyed. I solemnly charge you to conscientiously make every effort to offer yourself up as an approved worker who is unashamed for the benefit of God by specifically making it your habit of accurately teaching the message of truth. But for your own benefit, continue to make it your habit of avoiding the words lacking content which are worldly because they will, as a certainty, promote a greater depth of involvement with ungodliness. Furthermore, their teaching will, as a certainty, possess the characteristic of spreading like a cancerous disease, among whom are Hymenaeus as well as Philetus, those of such character who have committed apostasy with regards to the truth by communicating the resurrection has already taken place. Consequently, they're existing in the state of regularly overturning that which some believe.
However, despite this, the firm foundation, a metaphor for the church, constructed by God the Father, remains standing because it exists in the state of bearing this seal. And then he gives us a, a citation from Numbers 16.5. The Lord knows, in an omniscient sense, those who are his. Also, and actually, I, I was thinking about this today, it probably could be uh, rendered also, the, the, the word there, Kai, it actually could be rendered, I think it's Kai, you could be rendered as a marker of result, actually because the command to follow is a result of that quotation. So you could say, consequently, each and every one who does confess the Lord's name must make it their top priority of abstaining from unrighteousness. Then, in verses 20 through 21, he uh, reinforces that command. He says in verse 20, Indeed, in a large home, by no means does there exist only gold as well as silver vessels, but also wood as well as clay. In other words, on the one hand, some do exist in the state of being for honorable use, while on the other hand, some do exist in the state of being for dishonorable use. And then he explains the metaphor in verse 21. Therefore, if someone, speaking of no particular Christian, it could be anyone, if someone cleanses himself from these things, he will certainly exist in the state of being a vessel for honorable use. Consequently, he will specifically cause himself to be sanctified. So the whole passage really is talking about Timothy's sanctification. Useful for the master, causing himself to be prepared for every kind of action which is divine good in quality and character. So in verses 20 and 21, Paul's continuing his thought from the command he issued in verse 19. And remember in verse 19, at the, end, the command there at the end, he required that each and every Christian... Uh, who does confess the Lord's name, i.e., he believes in Jesus Christ as their Savior, that they're to make it their top priority of abstaining, abstaining from unrighteousness. In other words, sin. So he's talking about his sanctification. Uh, we're to, because we're in union with Christ, and now we have the basis for holy living, uh, because we're in union with the Holy One, Jesus Christ. So we, we, uh, we're to actually... Uh, when we talk about sanctification, that means we're set apart to serve the Lord exclusively and not to serve sin and Satan. If you notice in Romans 6 that we've been referring to, a great passage on sanctification, so is chapter 7 too, and, and chapter 8, but we see that Paul talks about serving sin and that we're no longer the slaves to sin because of our union and identification with Christ. So uh, when we're serving the Lord exclusively by our obedience, and in particular, appropriating by faith our position in Christ and considering ourselves dead to the sin nature and alive to God. Uh, when we're doing that, then we will automatically abstain from wickedness. Uh, remember, Paul talks about in Galatians chapter, I believe it's chapter 5, that uh, you don't have to turn there. But he makes, a, uh, he makes a comment that we're to concentrate on what the Spirit says. And if we do what the Spirit says, we won't, we won't sin. And so we don't have to be occupied with sin. Uh, that's what people do when they're under the bondage to the law. But it says, it, Paul says in Galatians 5, 16, but I say walk by the Spirit and you won't carry out the desire of the flesh. So the Spirit is speaking to Timothy and all of us here in the 21st century. And uh, if we listen to what the Spirit is saying here, uh, then we will experience our sanctification and at the same time, our salvation, our deliverance from sin and Satan, which constitute fellowship with God, or different ways of explain, uh, describing fellowship with God, and we won't, we won't commit sin. We won't, we'll abstain from unrighteousness. So most, uh, most English translations here in verse 20, uh, they look at it as transitional. In fact, the New American Standard translates verse 20, now. In a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. The very first word, now, it tells us that the translators interpret verse 20 as a transitional statement. Uh, and, and so that's why they use an English word that mar is used to mark a, tra a transition, the word now. But I don't believe that's the case. We see that this, con this conjunction should not be translated that way because Paul, in verse 20, employs a household metaphor to affirm his command in verse 19. So the metaphor in verses 20 and 21 is designed to reinforce the command in verse 19. So verse 20 is not a transitional statement. 
It's actually intimately connected to the command at the end of verse 19. In fact, it advances upon and intensifies and, and, and reinforces the command of, of, of verse 19. In fact, verse 21 is doing the same as well because the metaphor in verse 20 is explained in verse 21 and together those verses are, are what we call affirm, they're, uh, they're affirming the command of verse 19. So we could say that the word that's uh, used, as the, that's translated now in the New American Standard, it's the, it's the conjunction there, and we could, we could actually translate it as affirmative because it's introducing some statements that are affirming the command of verse 19. So this, uh, the metaphor in verses 20 and 21 is designed to reinforce the command in verse 19. And this household metaphor is talking about sanctification again. Sanctification is simply a technical theological term. It's found in the New Testament. And it talks about being set apart to serve the Lord exclusively. Uh, we were, remember, at the moment of our conversion, we were transferred, we saw this in Colossians chapter 1, we were transferred from Satan's kingdom and under the headship of Adam and at the, through the baptism of the Spirit, the minute we trusted in Jesus as our Savior, the moment of justification, our conversion, and the Holy Spirit placed us in union with Christ. So now that we're under the headship of Jesus and no longer under the headship of Adam, where there was cursing, we were under, the, the, we were under a curse because of, of Adam's sin in the garden. So now we're under the last Adam. If you look at Paul's writings, whether it's in 1 Corinthians or Romans, he makes this clear that God has put the human race under two people. So we, as Christians, are under the headship of Jesus Christ, and we're identified with him. We're united to him. We're intimately connected to him. We saw this in, uh, I believe it's Colossians as well, in our Sunday study. You know, we have, we have at least eight different metaphors in the New Testament that describe our intimate union with Jesus Christ. Whether it's he's the bridegroom and we're the bride, or he's the head, we're the body, or he's the vine, we're the branches, or he's the chief cornerstone, and we're the cornerstones of the building. Uh, all of those metaphors are designed to tell us, uh, show us how intimately connected we are to Jesus Christ. We're married to him. We're united to him. So uh, we're one flesh. So that's why I say God looks at us as he looks at his son. We're, not that we're the second person of the Trinity, but we're united or intimately uh, identified with Christ in several events that took place in his life that delivered us from sin and Satan. His crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection and session. And you see that all over Paul's writings. That is saying that we're saying, that's the positional aspect of sanctification. Sanctification is in three stages, just like salvation. Uh, we're not perfected yet. That's the final stage, which will take place at the rapture, the resurrection of the church. And at that time, we'll receive a body that will be immortal with no sin nature. And then in, we're, we're caught in between two worlds. Uh, we have what we, we, we're now, uh, we're waiting actually to be perfected, but we're not yet there. But we're t still told to experience our sanctification, experience the fact that we're set apart to serve God exclusively. So that is, uh, remember Jesus said in John 17, 17, that Lord, sancti Father, sanctify them by means of the truth. So that when we obey the truth, as it's being, as, as Timothy was to obey this truth that Paul was teaching him in chapter 2, Timothy would experience his sanctification, and so will we if we obey what Paul says here. So uh, then we, when we're doing that, if we're, obey, we're you know, walking by the Spirit, we won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. If we're obeying what the Spirit says through the teaching of the Word of God, we will not sin. If we're obeying God, we are not, we're not obeying the flesh and the devil, so therefore we're going to experience that sanctification. We're going to abstain from wickedness, unrighteousness. So this household metaphor in verses 20 and 21 uh, is uh, actually emphasizing the importance of Timothy in the Ephesian Christian community to live godly lives which honor the Lord. And what's the point of us living godly lives as Christians? Why is it important for us to experience our sanctification? Why is it important? Well, there's a number of reasons. Let's look at, first of all, what it means to God. God has created us and redeemed us through his son, identified us with his son at, through the baptism of the spirit for the purpose of us living to please him. We're here to please him. Just like a slave master 
of the slave lived to please his master. See, in our, in our day and age, in our day and age, we don't have slavery. And so we don't really, we, we, so I think the metaphors of the New Testament are really hard sometimes for people to understand because we don't have slavery as an institution. In the first century, they did. That's why we have to go back to the historical context in which Paul wrote and the other New Testament writers. So we understand what the, the recipients would understand. And so the fact that we, they would understand servant and master relationships, servant and ma slave and master relationships. In fact, the church, early church was composed quite a bit extensively of ma slave masters and slaves. And they would all understand the principle of obedience and pleasing the one you're, the, you're, you're serving. So that is what we need to understand. We're not here to live for ourselves. We're not here for any other purpose. We're here for one, other, one purpose and one purpose alone, and that's to f please the Lord. Now, all these other things that we talk about in life, marriage, kids, going to school, uh, get, uh, your, your job, where you work and making money, whatever you do, everything has got to be, that's all context. What, 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 at the heart of everything that you and I do in life, it's to, it's to please the Lord. So the first step in doing that is learning God's word like, as you're doing, and then we have to obey what he says. And so now our priorities, our perspective of life are shaped by what the Spirit is telling us in the word of God, and we will then make decisions that are going to please our, 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 uh, our master. Like Paul says, uh, no one, you know, he talks about Timothy, you know, the, no one in the military, you know, jo you know, chooses to go into the military to, you know, he goes in there to please his commanding officer. He lives to please his commanding officer when he's in the military. Well, that's the way we got to look at Jesus Christ. He's our commanding officer and we have to live to please him and make decisions that would please him. It's very important that we see that because if we don't understand that and don't see that and don't take it to heart and apply it, we're not going to live lives that bring glory to God. We'll be like the rest of the crowd out there in Christianity, the majority in Christianity today, which are in apostasy and are into uh, pleasing themselves and narcissistic. You know, it's, they're no different than the devil's wor people in the devil's world. So we, can't, we have to be different. And we showed that because we take first priority is what would the Lord think? What does, how, what does the Lord want me to do in this situation? How does he want me to think here? And what decision does he want me to, to make based upon what he's told me in his word? So Paul is telling Timothy, giving him guidelines for his, for his situation and, and how he can experience sanctification as related to his job as, as, as Paul's delegate to the Ephesian Christian com community. So this household metaphor emphasizes with Timothy and the Ephesian Christian community that they must live godly lives in which honor the Lord. So the first benefit, it pleases God. Why should we live godly lives? Because that's what God wants. We li we're here to please him. Secondly, it, it helps us. In what way? Well, the more Christ-like character we have, the greater joy we'll have in life, the, uh, the greater contentment. Uh, that doesn't mean you're not going to have any problems in life. I'm just saying, as for yourself, you'll have a clear conscience. You'll have, that's a great thing we often overlook. And a lot of people do, go to bed at night and they don't have a clear conscience. Well, if you're an obedient Christian, you'll have a clear conscience. And that's, a, that's one of the most wonderful things you could you ever have because there are people who have millions and millions of dollars of, in possessions and have no clear conscience. They get a guilty conscience. So they're, 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 they, there's something going on in their mind that's disturbing them constantly. Well, that's a great blessing. So obeying God and living godly lives is going to help us. We're going to get more of the character of Christ. Uh, we're going to have a more intimate fellowship with God. And it's going to give us more joy. It's going to give us wisdom, which means we'll, we'll learn how to do things God's way. And also, it's going to help others. Uh, it's going to, if you and I live godly lives and grow to maturity, it's going to help your fellow Christian. You're going to be a blessing to other Christians. How, how many Christians do you know that are a blessing to other Christians? I think most, most Christians today who are in ministry and faithful in it would realize that most Christians are basically mooching off the other Christians that are serving, meaning they're, they're, they're doing not much but simply observing other people serving. And they're not helping other people. They're getting, they're receiving, 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 but never giving back. 
You know, those of you who have been faithful in this ministry, you know, and, and, and even back to the days when I was at Prairie View, you know that, a few, and this is true in every ministry that I know, uh, that I've been in or know of, is that there's a small minority that's doing the serving, and the rest are just basically passing by, or, and they're, they're simply recipients. They receive, 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 but they never give back. They don't, they don't give of themselves to other Christians. They don't serve other Christians. They wouldn't know what that is because they're so narcissistic and all about themselves, and they never, they never learn that really actually to be happy is to serve others. That's what Jesus did. The Son of Man came to be served, uh, came to, not to be served, but to serve others and give his life as a ransom for many. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. And he gives us the example to follow. He said in Matthew 20, 20 through 28, to serve one another. Those who are going to be leaders, my apostles, my disciples, you're to be leaders of one, you're to show your leaders by serving each other. Now, Timothy, like Paul, was to serve the body of Christ by teaching them, by praying for them, by exemplifying godliness, giving them an example to follow. So that's what Timothy, as a as what pastors are, their service is to entail. As we said before, study, teach, pray, and exemplify godliness. Then you're serving the body of Christ, and and you're serving the body of Christ because you're feeding them the Word of God. So we have is then we have. That by serving God and serving and living to please Him, uh, the other benefit is that it helps the non-Christian, not just the Christian. By you and I living godly lives, we're going to benefit the non-Christian because we're giving a testimony with our godly character of who Jesus is. Some people will never pick up a Bible, will never come to a Bible class, but they can see Jesus in you by you applying His Word. Then they're going to see him. You've got to take Jesus to them. You've got to take your Bible and get that Bible in your head and in, manifested in your character. And that way, the unsaved, the non-Christian, is going to see Christ and is going to see the Bible for what it's worth. And maybe they'll come and take into consideration what you have to say about Jesus. So our godly conduct is very important. We saw last evening by a living ungodly lives, we can bring people to, it could cause people to slander the person of the Lord. We don't want that. But that's what can happen, like it did to Israel. Their ungodly character caused the, non, the Gentiles to uh, uh, slander and ridicule the Lord. And we don't want to have our conduct result in that. We want it to uh, result in the praise and glory of the Lord and lead people to the Savior. Now, those are, the, those are three major, it's going to, our living godly lives is going to not only, for Timothy and you and I in the 21st century, to live godly lives, it's going to benefit first God, it's going to benefit ourselves, it's going to benefit the non-Christian. And it's going to, be, it's going to also benefit your fellow, your fellow believers. So, consequently, we see, if we go back to the, the metaphor in 20, verses 20 and 21, it's again emphasizing the importance of Timothy and the Ephesian church living godly lives which honor the Lord. Consequently, they will stand in stark contrast to those who are living ungodly lives in the Ephesian Christian community as a result of adhering to the false doctrine taught by the, the apostate pastors which included Hymenaeus and Philetus. So don't miss that. Here's the other benefit of us living godly lives. Here's the benefit that we can derive from Paul telling Timothy, you know, to continue to remain faithful and thus live a godly life, exemplify godliness, because you will stand in stark contrast to the, those who are in apostasy in the, in the Christian church. So one of the things that, and I brought this out in studies in Titus and 1 Timothy and in 2 Timothy, is that when we're obedient to God, and we're living godly lives so that our character manifests the character and nature of God. And, and also, uh, it's, uh, our priorities manifest that. What happens is we serve as a rebuke to the, not, the Christian who's in apostasy, who's not obedient habitually. And so, therefore, maybe we will cause them to, uh, to repent by confessing their sins and doing what the Word of God says. Maybe your life might wake some Christian up as to what they're doing is wrong. 
when they see what you're doing is right. And listen to me, don't ever underestimate the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus brought this out in his ministry. He talked about this. His, everything he did was by the power of the Spirit or in obedience to God's word. Now, the Spirit was convicting the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees that he's the Messiah, but they rejected him. They said no to the Spirit. They slandered the Spirit. They blasted the Spirit by attributing Jesus' miracles to the devil. So they were actually calling the Holy Spirit a liar. Now, the Holy Spirit... It was behind, remember Jesus said, I, I perform these miracles by the power of the Spirit, the finger of God. So when we're, so the point that if you bring this over, and Paul brings this out, the, and, uh, the, the other apostles, is that it, we're actually serving as a rebuke to the Christian who's in apostasy because the Holy Spirit who indwells them is convicting them when they see our lies. So you can't forget about the Holy Spirit's work in people's lives. And a Christian in apostasy is got, still has the indwelling of the Spirit, the indwelling of the Trinity. They're grieving the Spirit. They're, they're quenching the Spirit. Ephesians 4.30 4, and with uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.19. So they're, they're, they're grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit. And that can't be a good experience for the Christian in apostasy. Uh, look, at, I can tell you, well, before I actually got serious about being a Christian, that before I became serious and got into the Word of God, the Holy Spirit would convict me of many things, lifestyle choices that I had when I was between 19 and 25. Uh, actually, you can say it all the way up to 30. But between that 10-year that period, the Holy Spirit would convict me of certain things that I was habitually doing. And one of the things that also is when you saw a Christian who was positive of the word of God and was living a godly life, it was convicting. And so don't underestimate that. Now, it may take a while for the Christian in apostasy to wake up, and they might never do it and die the sin to death. But you don't know. You're, you might be able to plant a seed in them. Somebody else comes in water, and next thing you know, they turn their life around, and they might, they might just be a, a great, uh, a, a faithful Christian for the rest of their lives. We just don't know. So by Timothy living a godly life and obeying Paul's command here, his, you know, to, by the Christian community in Timothy, obeying command, uh, uh, the command to abstain from un unrighteousness, and in other words, experience your sanctification, they would stand in stark contrast to the Christians in apostasy. Remember, in first, 2 Timothy 1.15, the majority of Christians in Asia had abandoned Paul, right? That means that they're in apostasy. You don't do that if you're not in apostasy, living in disobedience. Okay? So then we see in verses 22, 22 through 26, Paul actually spells out specifically how Timothy was to conduct himself. So go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, and look at my translation, please. So verses 22 through 26, Paul's actually going to spell out for Timothy how he was to conduct himself. All Christians are supposed to abstain from unrighteousness. He gives the household metaphor, which reinforces that command. And then he spells out in detail for Timothy what he was to do, how he was to conduct himself. Verse 22, now you continue making it your habit of avoiding youthful lust. That would be one of the ways you, Timothy would abstain from wickedness, unrighteousness. And that's to be true of us too. The youthful lust actually kind of imply that Timothy is uh, it could be a young man there, or it could be that he's now in his 40s, and now he's an older man, uh, and, and that day he'd be considered an older man to be in his 40s. And so don't go back to the way you used to live as a young man. Now, you continue to make it your habit of avoiding youthful lusts. Instead, continue to make it your habit of zealously practicing. Look at that, zealously practicing, so as to exemplify divine righteousness, which would mean... Uh, fulfilling your obligations to both God and man. What's that? Love the Lord thy God with all the heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Then he says also exemplifying Christian doctrine, divine love, the love of God in your life, peace, along with those who make it their habit of calling upon the Lord from a pure heart. But continue making your habit of avoiding foolish, yes, ignorant, pointless debates, false doctrine, because you know for certain that they do produce quarrels, and they're talking about quarrels over the law, as we pointed out. These are the false teachers, what they would do. Verse 24, however, in the interests of the Lord's slave, 
That's what we are, slaves. Some say servant, I'd like slave. Why? Because that's what the first century mind would translate uh, thulos. It would be a slave. He must never, as an eternal spiritual truth, be characterized as contentious, argumentative meaning, but rather to be characterized as gentle. Why? For the benefit of each and every Christian, every person, a skillful teacher, and that's what Timothy was. He must be patient. When you teach as a pastor, you have to be patient. Why? Because people just don't get it sometimes. And, you know, it's hard sometimes, especially when you listen to an hour. I, hey, I listen to a guy teach for an hour. I don't get everything the guy said in an hour. That's why if you, uh, the pastor is told to repeat, that demonstrates his patience because no one gets the entire message boom, all of it in an hour, and retains all of it, there's no way. That's why we're to repeat things. The, the, what Jesus taught and the apostles, they followed the rabbinic method, which was what? Repetition. And why do you think they were able to remember many of the things that Jesus taught? Because Jesus taught these things all the time throughout his three and a half year message. He had a message, he had messages, and the certain themes kept coming up and coming up. They remembered it because of the repetition. So then it goes on to say, the purpose of which, in verse 25, is to be characterized as correcting with gentleness. So this is, tr this is what the pastor needs to do. He needs to correct with gentleness. And also, this is what we should do as, for any Christian when we're talking to another Christian and we're trying to correct certain behavior that we know is wrong in the Word of God, uh, or we're talking to the non-Christian and we're trying to tell them about Jesus. We can't be hammering them over the head. We've got to be gentle with them. And remember, gentleness is power held in reserve. So the purpose of which is to be characterized as correcting with gentleness those who in their own self-interest are in opposition. In essence, what he's talking about there is administering church discipline, the first stage mentioned in Matthew 18, 15, which Paul says the, in Galatians 6, 1, the man on which we're to uh, uh, correct the Christian who is in opposition to sound doctrine is gentleness. So he's talking about the first stage of church discipline there. And then he goes on to say, perhaps God will grant them repentance. They'll confess their sin and start obeying the teaching, resulting in knowing experientially the truth. Consequently, they will become sober again. He talks about being in apostasy as being, it's implying that being in apostasy is like being drunk with lies from Satan's cosmic system. So the metaphor, that's what the metaphor there, they will become sober again is, is implying. So consequently, they will become sober again, freed from the devil's trap. Being an apostasy is the devil's trap for the Christian. After having been captured as a prisoner of war by him to do his will. So the Christian is like a prisoner of war. He's been captured by the devil. A prisoner of war, it belongs to his country still, right? Though he's been captured by another nation, well, what's happening? He's under the, he's under the, the, the bondage uh, and the will of the enemy. So that's what a Christian in apostasy has done. He's under the bondage and the will of Satan. And you and I, by administering church discipline, as Paul talks about there, and especially the, when he talks about the first stage, is that we're going, we have an opportunity, maybe the Holy Spirit will speak to them through our words, and they will confess their sin and start doing what the Word of God has to say, and then they'll be uh, no longer a prisoner of war of the enemy, Satan. So this is a conflict that we're involved here, spiritual warfare that we're involved in here, just like it was that Timothy was in, involved in in the first century. And Paul, the same spiritual warfare is going on now. In fact, people, it's intensified. We're at the end of the church age. They were expecting the end of the church age in the first century. It didn't happen right away. In fact, there's some indications that Paul... Uh, knew that the rapture was not going to happen for some time, but he said live in light of the imminency of it because it no one knows the hour and the, the moment that Christ will come back for, to raise the church. So we have to li live our lives with a, in, in light of the imminent return of Christ, and it's that much closer now than it was in the first century. And the intensification of Satan's efforts have intensified against the church because he knows it's the end of the line for him. Because once we're gone, comes Daniel's 70th week sometime after that, and you're talking about seven years, and then Satan's in prison for a thousand. And you don't think he knows that? His time is short, and we're at war. And as Paul says in Galatians, uh, Ephesians 6, our enemy is not each other, the church. 
You know, I'm not your enemy. We're not our enemies. In fact, Paul talks about uh, in dealing with a Christian in apostasy that you're, that you're to treat him as a brother or sister in Christ, not as an enemy. They're not your enemy. Who's the enemy for us? The kingdom of darkness. So this metaphor in 2 Timothy 2, 20 and 21, and the prohibitions and commands in verses 22 through 26 are all designed to encourage Timothy to continue being faithful to Paul's apostolic teaching and his ministry in Ephesus on behalf of the Ephesian Christian community in that city. They're also designed to encourage Timothy to continue to reject the false doctrine taught by these apostate pastors. Now, in this household metaphor, people, the church is clearly the house, and the various articles represent the individual members of the church. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 again, my translation. 2 Timothy 2, 20. It says, indeed, in a large house, in a large home, by no means does there exist only gold as well as silver vessels, but also wood as well as clay. In other words, on the one hand, some do exist in the state of being for honorable use, while on the other hand, some do exist in the state of being for dishonorable use. And in verse 21, it makes clear that what he's talking about in verse 20 is the church is the large home and the individual members are designated by the various articles that are gold or either gold or silver or wood or clay. So that's, this is quite interesting what the Lord is saying in this metaphor. So uh, in this household metaphor, the church is clearly the large home, and the various articles represent the individual members of the church. Now notice here that there are some articles that are for honor and some for dishonor. And that's an acknowledgement, people, that there are faithful Christians and unfaithful ones in apostasy. See, in the metaphor, he is distinguishing between two kinds of Christians. But some argue that he's not doing so. But only distinguishing between two types of teachers. Those who are unfaithful to the gospel and those who are faithful. However, if we look at the command in verse 19, that was addressed not just the pastors but the entire church. It states that everyone who does, everyone who does confess uh, the, name, the Lord's name must abstain from unrighteousness, and that's clearly a reference to anyone who's a Christian. So, although Paul, in verses 14 to 18, has been addressing the apostate pastors in Ephesus who were teaching false doctrines such as Hymenaeus and Philetus, and Timothy's responsibilities as a pastor in verses 22 through 26, this command in verse 19, as we pointed out, is applicable to every Christian and not just Timothy. In fact, in verse 19, remember Paul assured Timothy that despite the false doctrine taught by Hymenaeus and Philetus, the church will endure forever. He states that the reason for this is that the church, uh, that the church which is the firm foundation in verse 19, remains standing, will continue to endure, and because it bears a seal, which states that the Lord knows in an omniscient sense those who are his. So that this metaphor in verse 19 emphasizes with Timothy that the church will endure for, despite this attack of false doctrine from these apostate pastors within the Ephesian Christian community because why? The church is God's possession and it's designed to fulfill his purpose. Then on the heels of this in verse 19 Paul issues the command for every Christian to abstain from unrighteousness. So he's not only addressing Timothy specifically, or only pastors, but the entire church as well. By the Christian community and Timothy obeying this command in verse 19, they'll protect themselves from false doctrine, as I pointed out, that was being taught by these apostate pastors. So therefore, if we bring it all around to the household metaphor in verses 20 and 21, we see that it's not applicable to just only pastors or just, just Timothy, but it's going to be something that we can all apply. Yeah, he's talking to Timothy directly here, but obviously Timothy is going to communicate eventually these things. The church already knows these things, but he's talking to Timothy specifically, but what I'm saying is for us the application is, is pretty clear. Where did follow, Timothy, follow what Paul's telling Timothy here? That's what I'm trying to say to you. It's applicable to us. It's not something that we're uh, there's just talking about pastor's responsibilities here. He's actually talking about Timothy fulfilling his responsibility as a pastor to exemplify godliness. And we're all actually just commanded to exemplify godliness. That's what experiencing your sanctification and salvation is all about. Experiencing fellowship with God. 
is to exemplify godliness. We talked about that in 1 Timothy. So exemplifying godliness is, is, is by obeying God's word. Simple as that. So furthermore, we see that uh, the household metaphor in verses 20 and 21, again, is not only applicable to uh, Timothy and pastors, but also the entire church. And, and in verse 21, if you, as we just read, Paul says that if anyone cleanses himself, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified, and thus useful to the master, prepared for every good work, which indicates that the metaphor is directed at the entire church, too. So look at verse 21 again. It says, therefore, based upon that metaphor in verse 20, if someone, anyone, cleanses himself from these things, he will certainly exist in the state of being a vessel for honorable use. Consequently, he will specifically cause himself to be sanctified. For useful for the master, master, causing himself to be prepared for every kind of action which is divine good and quality and character. So we see that if we, even if we interpret verses 20 and 21 as applicable to only Timothy as a pastor, the metaphor is still applicable, as I said before, for all of us Christians. We can benefit from this. Since if any Christian obeys Paul's apostolic teaching here, they'll be a cleansed vessel. That will be of use for the Lord and a vessel of honor. So, the household articles that we read about in verse 20, they're speaking of Christians. It's speaking of the individual members of the church. It's category, categorizing two Christians. You're either a Christian that's of honorable use, just like in a wealthy person's home in the first century, gold and silver articles were for honorable use. They never threw those things out because they were gold and silver. They're valuable. Whereas, the clay and the wood articles were used to get rid of excrement and trash and whatnot, and many times were thrown out with the trash and the excrement. And so they would do that, and those, the Christian who is in apostasy is like those dishonorable articles, which are used for dishonorable, ignoble things, and were not considered valuable. Wood and clay articles in a home were used for stuff that, you know, for garbage and excrement, like I said, and they were not as valuable, of course, as the gold and silver articles. The homeowner would hang on to them. So the, the, metaphor, the, if we, the, the metaphor is that, if we apply it to the church, is that we want to be a Christian that is valuable to the Father. See, if we're in apostasy, we're not valuable to him. Now, again, remember, does that mean that he doesn't love us anymore? I didn't say that. I'm saying... We're no use to him. When we're experiencing, our, what's sanctification again? It's being set apart to serve God exclusively. We're here to fulfill his purpose. If we're in apostasy, how are we fulfilling his purpose for our lives? Did he save us so we could go into apostasy? So that we could be disobedient to him? So that we could be in bondage to sin and Satan again? No. That's what he's, so this is what we need to understand here. So this is a great, this metaphor, this household metaphor in verses 20 and 21, is a great way to describe sanctification. It's a great way to describe it. And so we have two categories of Christian, the Holy Spirit is saying. Those who are dishonoring the Lord, that are of no use to the Lord, and those who are of honorable use and valuable to him because they're obeying him. So the household articles and the metaphor are distinguished on the basis of the material which they're composed of. There are materials mentioned, namely wood, as earthenware or clay, and then there's gold and silver, as I pointed out and as we read. The presence of the gold here and the silver articles in this metaphor indicates that Paul is speaking specifically of a wealthy homeowner. And this is also indicated by the fact that the apostle is speaking of articles contained in a large house. So that's what he, So we look at verse 20 again. Indeed, in a large home. Well, if you're a poor person, you don't have a large home. Okay? I live in an apartment. I'm not a rich person. There's some people I know that live, live in huge homes. Okay? They're wealthy. You live in a big home. You're well. I know you probably say, well, I'm not wealthy because... No. Let's put it this way. You're wealthy here in America. If you live in a big home, I'm sorry. You're wealthy compared to the rest of the world. Relatively speaking, most people live in shacks and huts and little apartments. Okay? So, and don't get guilty because I, I live in a big house. That's good for you. Great. That's great. Live in a castle for all I care. Can't take it with you. But the point is, is that if you're in a wealthy, if you're living in a large house, you got money. 
okay? And you have the money to buy gold and silver articles. So when Paul's talking about, he says, indeed in a large home, that's an indication that we're talking about a wealthy homeowner in the first century. And then he says, and indeed in a large home, by no means does there exist only gold as well as silver vessels, but also wood as well as clay. So if you're, you can't afford gold and silver articles if you're poor. So this is telling us it's a wealthy homeowner. And so here, in the metaphor, God is the wealthy homeowner. Aren't we a part of his house? His household? God is, who's wealthier than God? He's the owner of a cattle on a thousand hills. All the money and all the wealth in the world and all, everything is, belongs to God. It's his earth. It's his gold. It's his silver. It's his materials. It's his trees. It's his air. It's everything is his. So God is, being, is the wealthy homeowner here. That's what's going on here. So the gold and silver articles represent, obviously, faithful Christians. And the wood and clay, those who are unfaithful. And that's indicated by the fact that in Paul's day in the first century, again, gold and silver vessels were in a wealthy home, and they were esteemed as honorable because they were used for honorable functions. On the other hand, the wooden clay vessels were regarded as dishonorable. And why? Because they were used to, for garbage and excrement and were sometimes thrown out with their contents. They didn't have toilets back then. Okay? So they, they would use certain wooden and clay articles for excrement, human excrement. So they were not used for honorable use and they weren't considered valuable. They were considered useful, but they weren't valuable like the gold and silver articles. You've got to hang on to those because they were worth something. So Paul's statement in verse 21 which explains this metaphor, would make clear to Timothy and that those teachers and Christians who are, are faithful are represented by the gold and silver vessels in the metaphor which are regarded by the Lord as possessing an honorable function. For those Christians and pastors who are faithful to the word of God are dedicated disciples of the Lord because, and they show it by their studying God's word and a, and a habitual basis and applying it in their lives and they serve, they, they give their time, talent and treasure and truth. You are an honorable vessel. You're pleasing to him. You're valuable to him and that should be an encouragement to all of you in front of me who serve and listening to me who are serving the Lord and are obedient. Paul's statement again is uh, in verse 21 explains the metaphor and it would make clear that Timothy and those who were faithful to his teaching and uh, are represented by the gold and silver vessels and the metaphor, and they're regarded by the Lord as having an honorable function. So on the other hand, those who were unfaithful to Paul's apostolic teaching were regarded by the Lord as possessing a dishonorable function in the church. So the person who's an apostasy, and who's a Christian, who's habitually disobeying the word of God and not serving, and, and, and there's many of them, they're still a part of God's household, but they're not considered being used honorably because they're not being, God's not can't use them. I mean, he could use them to, you know, advance other believers who are positive, but ultimately they're not fulfilling the purpose for which he re created and redeemed them and saved them. So they're of no use to God. They're useless. When we talk about second, when Titus, you know, there are some, uh, we, we, we don't want to be useless for the master. We want to be able to fulfill the function for which he created and redeemed us. And so a person who's an apostasy, a Christian in apostasy, they're, they're, they're like those wooden clay vessels and a, and a wealthy homeowner in the first century which were used for dishonorable use. Excrement, garbage, they're not, but the gold, they're still a part of the household, but they're not, they're not having an honorable function which is represented by the gold and silver vessels. We want to be the ones that are the, represented by the gold and silver vessels, and we can do that as long as we stay obedient to God's word. Now, verse 21 emphasizes that Timothy must be obedient to Paul's apostolic teaching if he's going to continue to be a vessel which honors the Lord. Remember, we saw in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, Paul says, I'm convinced, Timothy, of the faith in you. In fact, in fact, uh, in, what is it? And I just read it <laughs> today. Uh, yeah, look at, uh, look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Look at verse 10. 
Paul affirms, comes right out and explicitly says that, that Timothy was doing what he was adhering to closely to Paul's teaching. So he was faithful. He was a, a vessel who was being used for honorable use in the Lord's household. 2 Timothy 3.10 Now you followed my teaching, Timothy. Your, my conduct followed means you closely adhered to my teaching. My conduct, my purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, and persecutions. And, and let me see if I, what the Net Bible says about and translates that. You, however, have followed my teaching. I like it better. My way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my endurance. I like that translation much better. As well as the persecutions and sufferings. So he's saying, you have followed. Means it, it, you closely adhered to it, my teaching. So that's a, a Paul affirming that Timothy was a vessel of honor. So what he's saying to Timothy now, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, is all designed to encourage Timothy to keep going. So for those of us who are faithful and have, have done this, have been, remained faithful to the Lord, this is an encouragement to us in the 21st century because it's just as applicable to us as it was for Timothy in the 1st century. So second, uh, we see that the apostate pastors in Ephesus, in contrast to Timothy, were vessels of dishonor because of their rejection of Paul's apostolic teaching, whose content, of course, was the gospel. And this would th then support or reinforce the command in verse 19 that the Christian must make it their top priority of abstaining from unrighteousness. So it goes right back again, and it's as simple as this. Everything is your attitude to the word of God. Everything is your attitude toward the Word of God. What, what is your attitude toward the Word of God? Because that's going to determine whether you're a gold or silver vessel, and, or, and a vessel that's in the Lord's house that's for, used for honorable purposes, that is useful for Him and sanctified. Or you're going to be a dishonorable vessel that's not being used for the purpose for which the Lord created and redeemed you and saved you. Your attitude, my attitude... Until the word of God is everything. And it's just not just, oh, I'll listen to it and listen and learn. But we've got to take it to heart. We've got to meditate upon what we learn. Talk about it to God in prayer. Ask God to help us to apply these things and show us the right way. We've got to have that attitude. It's because that's going to determine if we're an honorable vessel or not. And look at, uh, let's see if I can find it. Look at Luke. Look at Luke. I think it's Luke. Now look at Luke chapter while you go there I'm, I'm going to see if I can find there's another passage I'm looking for too Luke chapter 8, look at verse 1. I actually, you know what? Look at verse 4. I wonder if that's there. All right. Look at Luke uh, chapter 8. Verse 4, when a large cry was coming together and those from the various cities were journeying to him, he spoke by way of a parable. The sower went out to sow his seed and as he sowed, some fell beside the road and it was trampled underfoot and the birds of the air ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky soil and as soon as it grew up, it would withered away because it had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns and the thorns grew up and with it and choked it out. Other seed fell into the good soil and grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as great. He said these things and he would call out, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples began questioning him as to what this parable meant. And he said, to you, it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is in parables, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this, 
The seed is the word of God. Those beside the road are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart. Speaking of the non-believer. So that they will not believe and be saved. Then he says, those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, they receive the word with joy. That's justification. And they, these have no firm root. They believe for a while, the moment of their conversion, maybe a little after that they obey. And in time of temptation, they fall away. The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard. And as they go on their way, they're choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. That's the majority of Christians I see in America. Right there. I can't tell you how many people I've seen. They're just, it's just like I read this, it's like it's so real. It's like how many Christians I know, they have worries and riches and pleasures of this life. And you know what? They never bring fruit to maturity because all those things choke out the word from their life. Then verse 15, this is what we want to be here in verse 15. But the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest, you know, they take it to heart. They don't sit there and try to, try to apply it to their wife or their husband or their father or their mother, you know, their pastor. They apply it to themselves. They think about how it applies to me. Try to, and, and they're honest about it. They don't, you know, sit there and go, oh, and try to, you know, justify sin. You know, I'm guilty here. And they're honest. Okay, I need to make changes. That's what he means by an honest and good heart. And they hold it fast. And bear fruit. They grow to maturity, Christ-like character. They live a godly life. And look at this, with perseverance. Need perseverance to do this. The Holy Spirit produces this perseverance as we are obeying the word of God. So go back to 2 Timothy, please. In 2 Timothy 2.20, Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.20, and I'm reading from my translation again. Indeed, in a large home, by no means does there exist only gold as well as silver vessels, but also wood as well as clay. In other words, on the one hand, some do exist, some of these articles do exist in a state of being for honorable use, while on the other hand, some do exist in a state of being for dishonorable use. So in verse 20 there, Paul is affirming his command at the end of verse 19 that each and every Christian must make it their top priority of abstaining from unrighteousness. The metaphor emphasizes that if the Christian wants to be considered by the Lord as a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful to the master, prepared for every good work, then they must remain faithful to Paul's teaching which presents the gospel. So uh, in the metaphor, Paul says that this house, as we can clearly see as we read this, is this house is a large one which contains gold and silver articles or vessels and that would indicate again that this is a wealthy person's home because only such people uh, could afford such expensive vessels and articles and afford, and allow, and afford a, a spacious home like that. So verse 20 is actually as we can see is composed of two correlative clauses and the first is emphatic stressing that a large home of a wealthy person is not limited to possessing gold and silver vessels, but also possesses wood and clay vessels as well. Now the first correlative clause presents an emphatic contrast between gold and silver articles in a large home of a wealthy person and wood and clay vessels in this home as well. The emphatic contrast is between the vessels in a home which are valuable and those which are not and also between those vessel, vessels which are of honorable use and those ignoble use. So again, the emphasis here, as we know, it's, it's, it's talking about Christians, two categories of Christians, those who are in apostasy, unfaithful, and those who are faithful, obedient. It's emphasizing with Timothy, this is, this is what we can be here. This is, and it's actually at the same time, he's, he's reassuring Timothy that God's got everything under control. This is no... Uh, surprise that there's this, this apostasy in the church. God's already planned for that. Doesn't mean he agrees with it, but his permissive will is in play with those in apostasy. So the second correlative clause is actually exegetical, meaning that it's explaining specifically the two different categories of vessels mentioned in the previous correlative clause. And specifically, it's explaining the purpose of these two categories of vessels in a large home of a wealthy person. And the second correlative clause expresses a contrast between those vessels in a large home of a wealthy person having a noble or honorable use and those which have an ignoble or dishonorable use. So the gold and silver vessels, which were for honorable use, represent those Christians and pastors who remain faithful to his apostolic teaching and whose content is the gospel. And in direct contrast, 
The vessels which were for dishonorable use represent those in apostasy in the church who did not remain faithful to the gospel and were not obeying it. So, hold your place for a second. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Quickly. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. book we're going to do, Lord willing. Both of those books we're going to do. We're probably going to do them one right after the other. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for what? Unwick uh, for wickedness? Unrighteousness? Ungodly living? Being an apostate Christian? No. He's chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification. Meaning he's saying you could experience your deliverance from sin and Satan by experiencing your sanctification. By experiencing the fact that you're set apart for God. And you do that by considering yourself dead to the sin nature and alive to God. Why? Because you've died with Christ and you're raised with Christ. So he's chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. Look at John's Gospel, chapter 17. Again, everything comes down to your attitude toward the Word of God. As I mentioned earlier with that, 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 meta, uh, that uh, uh, parable there in, in Luke 8, look at John's Gospel, chapter 17, verse 17. If we're going to experience our sanctification, it's got to be by means of truth. When T Timothy would understand that, he says, well, I gotta, by means of truth, by what Paul told me in this epistle, this is his second epistle to me. I'm sure he had more uh, others that, that were he sent to uh, Timothy. These are the only things that are part of the, two are part of the canon of Scripture. But if I obey what Paul's saying under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to be sanctified by means of truth. I'll please the Lord. John 17, 17, sanctify them, believers, in the truth. He actually translates in the truth. I don't know why they don't do this. It's by means of the truth. It's the means by which we experience our sanctification. Sanctify them by means of truth. And he, he says, your word is truth. And so if Timothy and you and I, if Timothy was to experience his sanctification and being useful to the master and be an honorable vessel, and, and, as represented by the gold and silver articles in the large wealthy person's home, the, the wealthy person's large home, not the wealthy person was large, if we do this, <laughs> you caught that when I said that. And when we do this, you know, when Timothy does this, it, it, he's going to do it. If he obeys what Paul says here, he's going to be sanctified by means of the truth. And if we do the same, if we obey what Paul says here in, in, in 2 Timothy and what he said through what we read throughout this evening, and in the times past, and like Romans 6 and all those things, and all those books we've done, we're going to be experience our sanctification. We're going to be a, we're going to be an honorable vessel. So. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 and 21, both of these verses would encourage Timothy to not be shocked, and this is what we need to understand too. All of this would encourage, these two verses would encourage Timothy to not be shocked or taken back by the fact that there are Christians whose conduct dishonors the Lord. Because he's saying that in the Lord's home, there are Christians who are for dishonorable use, and those who are for honorable use. Those are valuable to the Lord and those which are not. That's what the metaphor is telling us. So he's saying to Timothy and us here in the 21st century. And he said, and, and through this metaphor, he's teaching the church throughout the centuries. That we should never be shocked by the apostasy that's in the church. It's predicted. In fact, it's predicted in, in, second, in second Timothy chapter 3, this apostasy. Uh, in, in my translation of 2 Timothy chapter 3, how many verses do you have done? Uh, tell me you have, how many uh, verses have we got? Now, yeah, I tell you what, just look at the numeric, uh, just read from your own Bible. Here. What's that? Seven. Up to 7? Okay, I wanted to go a little further, but look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Look at verse 1. You can read from your Bible. And as I, I touched on this a couple weeks ago, Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, was it verses 1 through 7? Actually, in verses 1 through 5. That, and then in verses 6 and 7, he talks about the apostate pastors in Timothy's day, in the first century. But in verse, verses 1 through 5, he's, saying, he's describing the apostasy that's in the church throughout the church age. Okay? 
It, 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 there's always been apostasy in the church. Read, read, read Paul. There was apostasy in the Ephesian church like, like crazy. Uh, and, and then you read into the early church fathers. They were dealing with apostasy in the church. You go all the way to, you know, up to Calvin and Luther and you go into our day and age. There's always been apostasy in the church. But it's intensifying because the church age is winding down. So 2 Timothy 3, 1 says, but realize this, that in the last days, and we're in the last days, uh, you compare, uh, this, well, when, we, when we get to this passage, well, I'll show you, we're in the last days, the apostles all, the, the, the last days began with Jesus' death and resurrection. And between the first and second advents of Jesus Christ is the last days. So we're in the last days. So when you see a day, you're thinking, oh, oh like oh, a week. You know, we, that's how we think. <laughs> but he's, he's actually talking, this is a period of time between the first and second advents, and we're in that period of time. It's called the last days. So where's the church age? In between the first and second advent of Christ. So he says, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come for men. And he's speaking to Christians. I used to think for the longest time, he's thinking about the non-Christian. He says, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy. They'll be characterized by all these things. Unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. And then this is the command to follow says, this is Christians, because he says, Avoid such men as these. He would never say, if you read 1 Corinthians 5, he's saying, this is church discipline. Avoid them. He would never say that to, to, to the church to avoid the non-Christian. He says that in 1 Corinthians 5. He says to uh, associate with the immoral Christian, the, the, person, the Christian in apostasy. Read 1 Corinthians 5, compare it with that. So the fact that he says avoid such men tips you off that it's Christians. Look at, look at 1 Corinthians 5. Five, let me show you real quick. Look at verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. 1 Corinthians 5, 9. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world, the non-Christian. Or with the covetous and swindlers or with idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. But I actually wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother, Christian. If he is an immoral person, or covetous, or an idolater, or a viler, or a drunkard, or a swindler, that's telling you who the people you need to disassociate with that are Christians. Not even to eat with such a one. Don't even sit down and eat with them. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? So Paul wouldn't have any authority to say to avoid these he wouldn't say to avoid those non-Christians. He'd say to avoid the Christians in, in apostasy. But those who are outside God judges, the unsaved, remove the wicked man from me among yourselves. So when he says in 2 Timothy 3, 5, avoid such men as these, the men he describes in verses 1 through 4 are Christians because he would never tell a Christian like Timothy to avoid the non-Christian. He'd have to go out of the world, right? No, he's talking about not to associate with apostate Christians who are characterized by those awful sinful life behavior patterns. So, now you can go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we'll close. Finally. So everything that Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20, he says, Indeed, in a large home, by no means does there exist only gold as well as silver vessels, but also wood as well as clay. In other words, on the one hand, some do exist. Some of these vessels do exist in the state of being for honorable use. While on the other hand, some do exist in the state of being for dishonorable use. Therefore, here's the explanation of the metaphor. If someone cleanses himself, a Christian, from these things, he will certainly exist in the state of being a vessel, vessel for honorable use. Consequently, he will specifically cause himself to be sanctified, Useful for the master, causing himself to be prepared for every kind of action which is divine good and quality and character. All of what he's saying there is designed to encourage Timothy to not be shocked or taken aback by the fact that there are Christians whose conduct is dishonors the Lord. They're still a part of God's household. The church, it's still part of God's household, the church, our, our brothers and sisters in Christ that are in apostasy. Because they're, they're part of God's household, the church, but because their conduct dishonors the Lord, they're not as valuable to him. 
as those whose conduct who honors him. Just as the gold and silver vessels in a wealthy home are of more value than wooden clay vessels. Did I say he loves them less? No, I didn't say that. What I said is they're not as useful to them and not as valuable to them. Come on, think about it. Is your child useful to you if they're disobedient? I ask them to mow the lawn, clean the house, do the dishes, and they don't do any of those things. Are they useful to you, parents? Absolutely not. But if they're obedient to you, and they do do the dishes, and they do vacuum, and they mow the lawn, they do different things for you in the house, they're useful. Do you still love them if they weren't useful? Of course you do. You discipline them if they were disobedient and not being useful. But because they're obedient, they're useful to you. If, so same thing in God's household. He still loves the Christians who are dis, habitually disobedient and in apostasy. But they're not useful to him like the person who is obedient. Because the person who is obedient is fulfilling the purpose for which they were created and redeemed and sanctified and saved. Whereas the disobedient Christian is not fulfilling the purpose for which God created him and saved them. So those in apostasy in the church are ineffective and advancing Jesus Christ's cause in the devil's world, whereas those who are faithful are indeed advancing the cause of Jesus Christ. Who do you think God's, who's more useful in advancing the cause of Christ? An obedient believer who knows his Bible and does it, and is dedicated and perseveres and serves. Who do you think, you think they're more, you think they're more uh, uh, useful to the cause of Christ than the, the Christian who is living for self, doesn't go to church, doesn't serve, doesn't know his Bible, doesn't care about anybody but himself and his own, and his own cause. Who's more useful? Obviously, the one who's obedient. And that's who we want to be. And if we're, and the Spirit is doing one of two things here. He's either convicting you if you're not or saying, hey, you, you know, you're, you, you know you're, you're doing this. So the Spirit, to, uh, for those who are, are, are being encouraged, is don't get cocky, but and, you know, be humble. Keep doing what you're doing. Persevere. Be encouraged. Don't be discouraged by the apostasy. God knows all about it. It'll be dealt with at the Bama seat and do church and do discipline. And just concern yourself. Put your head down. Keep doing what God's doing, told you to do, and everything will work out just right. And uh, not to be discouraged by what's going on around you. Just worry about what you need to do and how what you need to do and to help your church and help the cause of Christ before the unsaved community. Well, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would encourage and instruct us with what we've heard, would reprove and rebuke us if uh, necessary, and uh, help us to make changes, uh, help us to persevere if we're already doing what we're supposed to be doing, help us not to be satisfied, but to want to excel in God, your love and in faith and perseverance. Help us uh, to... Uh, continue forward in your plan, and we just thank you, Father, for your word and the, the gift of the Spirit, and we pray that the Spirit would do a mighty work through your people uh, and uh, bring glory to yourself and your Son, Jesus Christ. And our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.